You're listening to the Christian Indie Artists and Songwriters Podcast, the place where faith, music, and life intersect. We exist to help Christian indie artists and songwriters just like you get songs heard. Hey, I'm here with my friend Aaron Hoskins coming to us live this morning from Texas. How's it going over there, man? Man, we're doing good. Got a great weather over here finally and uh, out of the snowpocalypse. Awesome, man. Yeah, because, you know, depending on when people are hearing this, like Texas just went through one of the most wild winter storms in history, right? Absolutely. Yeah, we were seeing pipes busting everywhere and uh, houses. So many of our friends had houses that completely flooded without electricity mm. for at up to three to four days, which is unheard of wow. in this area. And we yeah. definitely do not have the infrastructure set up to handle such kind of a storm. Man, well, you know, praise God that you guys are okay. And uh, some other of my friends I've talked to in that area have been doing well also, but keep pr- we'll keep praying for those who experience some hard times. You know, I'm excited. We met ironically we met in montana although i'm in florida and you're in texas but we met in montana (laughs) and geez that's going to be a couple years ago now man i know time flies it's uh it's wild so you know we met through music you know with that in mind like where did your music journey kind of start like where did it all begin for you sure man my music journey began when i was a kid just growing up in a home where you know my parents were always playing music Uh, Christian radio in particular, that is Mm. my niche. If you start going into the 70s or 80s playing a lot of the what everybody would call the classics, I'm like, I've never heard that song before. So I do not. I'm not very eclectic by any (laughs) stretch. And my wife gives me a hard time about it whenever Chicago comes on the air and she's singing a song and I'm like, I don't know that one. And she's just (laughs) busting out the lyrics. Um, But I grew up listening to a lot of music, just a very specific genre and my parents all played piano my dad primarily played all the time mom and dad both sang and so that was just music constantly flooded our house there was never a Mm. hardly a day that would not there would not be something playing even while we're doing schoolwork or whatever they just a quiet house was not what we lived in and so from there started learning piano lessons in second grade and continued to take lessons all the way through high school i probably around Gosh, I think it was junior high is when piano started to not become a drudgery because you're like playing all mm. the the classical music and sonatina festivals. And you're like, oh, I hate this as a kid. <laughs> uh, and it shifted to, oh, I could learn how to play chords and kind of put my own spin on a song. And so mm. I started shifting in that direction. Um, learning how to improv myself. And that's when it started to become fun. A friend of mine, we started our youth band in our youth group and just started to see what that looks like to lead. And then from there, went into college and continued to do some piano lessons more just to get a better skill set and more diverse in terms of how I play. Um, I can't say that I succeeded, (laughs) but... uh, (laughs) I got, I certainly got better at reading music and the music theory and all that, just really uh, expanding in my understanding of how things work and why they work. And then uh, just all the while continuing to lead in worship bands uh, in college and just get my feet wet. Got the great privilege of of even being a part of a breakaway at Texas A&M. We were a guest uh, band that played there. And so there was just some really neat opportunities that I was afforded. And then really just as I continued to play and, you know, the idea of becoming a worship pastor became a reality or a possibility Mm -hmm. as I stepped into that role, um, realized I needed to even learn guitar uh, because I get, (laughs) I get tired of looking at the, the poor guitarist on my team and I'm not, I don't have the language to communicate to him, Hey, play this, not that, that sounds too campfirey, but then he has no idea what I'm wanting to play. So I had to learn. So that way he would know what I want from him and all that. So I'll stop there because it's it, the musical journey is quite extensive. No, that's that's awesome. So, you know, piano was first. You've got music flowing through your house. I love that because that reminds me of my childhood, too. And although it's kind of funny, like we had the Christian music, too, but like all of the 60s, 70s and 80s music, like I grew up in like like Loggins and Messina and like yeah, the buddy. police and staying and, and all of that. Even there was one Christmas morning that my parents, it must've been when we were older. Cause I used to wake up like 4am for Christmas, but there was one where we were actually sleeping 
and the my parents were cranking "Give Me Shelter" by uh, <laughs> the Rolling Stones. So I every time I hear that song, most people think of like epic like war movies. I think of Christmas when I hear "Give Me Shelter" as a yeah, song. buddy. <laughs> but I love I love that music was just in you know it was literally the soundtrack to your life, and then you had to just start you know once you were able to click and start making it yourself like what a gift that is. And then, you know, the servant leader side of, Hey, like I need to be able to communicate this to my team. So I got to pick up guitar. Cause I mean, I feel like when I met you, I didn't actually even know you played keys. I thought you played guitar because mm-hmm. you're, you know, you're rocking the acoustic. So, so that's awesome. So from that kind of scene of just kind of learning and getting your, cutting your teeth in the worship world, like where did, where did God start to show you that, Hey, this, this could be like a, a actual job for me. Like, where did that kind of happen in, in some of that story? Yeah, that's great. Um, I went to A&M, Texas A&M thinking that I want, and again, what do you, what does a high school kid really know when he goes to college? Like, what does he want to do? And so, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the idea of even picking a major freaked me out. And so I had to pick something just to kind of pick a lane. And so i thought maybe I might go into um, computer engineering thinking that I might be trying to work with com- with music software. Hmm, this okay. is a kid who had never done a computer programming course in his life. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I, I quickly realized that when my graduate assistant is practically writing my computer code to help me even pass the dang class, I, <laughs> I was realizing real quick that this was not the, the path for me. And so, and around that time when I was supposed to even be signing up for my second semester of engineering classes and just freaking out because so much of this Mm. stuff is like just really hard. I have a deep appreciation for our engineers. I don't have that kind of a mind. And around that time, a, uh, oddly enough, a music, full music major surfaced at Texas A&M. And granted, Mm. no one knows that Texas A&M is a, is a music school. I didn't even know because it wasn't even there. They had a minor. And in that year that I was there, they changed that minor to a major. And very much so, I was their guinea pig for several years as they figured out what worked. And now they've got a uh, full-blown massive music building and all the -the state-of-the-art equipment. And I'm like, oh, why didn't I have that? Because all I had was the third floor of the academic building, which is that (laughs) iconic building Whenever you have college game day and they fly over the academic building, like you see it, third mm. floor of that old building was all I had. And so I'm <laughs> working on a studio in there and just trying to get uh, my feet wet, thinking maybe I'll go into the recording engineering. This feels more like what I want to do. But mm-hmm. then again, you fast forward to get to graduation and you go home and then I'm realizing, oh no, I should have been getting in the studios while a student not as a graduate and also wanted to be a family guy. And so I didn't feel like I had the cutthroat personality to do what it takes to get in the studios and, and make it, I wanted a family. And so all the while I had been, like I said, leading with the worship band and, and getting exposed to that. Um, I really believe one of the primary reasons of my discipleship um, or my reason for being at A&M was the discipleship I received from Grace Bible Church there. Hmm. And it was through that that I think God used that church to form my heart for ministry. But I didn't, at the time when I graduated, didn't want ministry to be a fallback plan. I wanted it to be a calling. I didn't want to just kind of go, hey, this I'll give you my plan B, God. Hmm. And so while I'm at home and I'm working as a waiter at a country club, really kind of questioning everything (laughs) and feeling like a complete failure, I'm leading, uh, I got the opportunity to be an intern at my home church, Irving Bible Church, and uh, there was a special mo- uh, service that they had um, and for all of their staff and elders where they were all going to come out down to the front of the stage and there was going to be some kind of commissioning and blessing. But in order for everybody to participate, they needed someone else to be leading worship that day and not staff and not even the worship pastor. So they asked me Mm. to do that, which I was grateful for. And it was a really cool service, but what was really meaningful was at the fourth service, this is probably holds a room of 1500 people. And so this is a, uh, you know, coming up on the fourth time of a full house and um, I'm just singing at a piano. I got this fantastic backup vocalist just making me sound a lot better than I really was, but we're, (laughs) So it's kind of, it almost feels like I'm starting to go through the the motions of here's number four, let's do this. But what was, mm-hmm. 
a holy moment for me. It was in that moment, and I'm playing Charlie Hall's Single Minded, and we get to the chorus, and I'm singing, all of life comes down to just one thing, and that's to know you, oh Jesus, and make you known. I just mm. felt in that moment the Spirit of God just descend on the room because I was became really aware of all these voices that are singing because I'm leading them, and mm. I'm hearing the piano and the the acoustics and everything, just the beauty of worship. And that I'm, I'm, I'm the, the conductor of that moment. Um, yeah. And then, and I grew up Bible church and Baptist background. So charismatic experience are not common to me. But for me in that moment, I felt the spirit of God speak directly to my heart saying a very specific statement, uh, namely, this is why you are created. And from wow. that point on, I never questioned a calling. I just needed the opportunity to lead. And and that time I was putting resumes out to churches and God provided a lot of unique appointments of people and intersections uh, with life to essentially lead me to my first church who gave me my first shot at leading uh, their team without really having uh, ever led a team of my own ever. And so they gave me a shot and the rest is history from there. Man, that's so good. You know, those moments where, cause we all, we've all asked that question, like, what am I here for? You know, especially like, early twenties, whatever. We're like, what, what am I supposed to do? Like, right. So, so when we allow God to, not that you were like, okay, I'm going to do these four services because, you know, God's going to speak to me. And you know, obviously had no idea until right. that one moment. And, and I love too, that it wasn't even like the first time you did it or the second or the third, it was the fourth service where yep. that moment happened, you know? Yep. So like he just con like cemented that in you. And then literally, you know, Many years later, you're you're doing that in, in a high level. So, you know, I met when we met. You were you're writing for the church, mm -hmm. you know, and you had already I'd already seen that you guys had recorded and released some music and stuff. So, like, at what part in the journey of of being, you know, the worship pastor at the, that first church did it kind of start? Did you start writing music at that first church, or like, where did that songwriting for your congregation kind of start? Mm, yeah, well, it just started really honestly with the the encouragement of my lead pastor, and he just mm. pulled me aside and said, "Hey, this is not a requirement of your job, but I'd like you to consider trying your hand at this." At the time, I felt like around the time that he made the ask, I was on the cusp of all these churches that you and I both have seen to start releasing stuff. And so that was the cool yeah. thing to do. And I just didn't feel like my motives were right. I didn't want to release something just because we're, we want to put our name out there. Mm -hmm. And he, he just encouraged me with like, Hey, everybody's going to be wrestling with that. Um, authors, creatives, they're all going to be, there is going to be a measure of, of ego that has to be checked. Um, but what I was severely challenged by was I completely underestimated the impact of putting a song, a, an original song that has come from our own people in their mouths. Mm. I mean, I grew up singing all the songs of like, you know, hymns and, um, you know, the early days of like, you know, Keith Green and Steve Green and all of these, you know, guys. And then at the same time, we are singing all these songs and we know them, but there's something unique and moving about a song that's unique to your community. And, mm -hmm. and so because of that, I've just tried my hand at something. My first song that I played with was Be Thou My Vision. And just mm. said, hey, that doesn't really have a chorus. Let me try with this and play around with it. And, you know, tried my hand at writing and brought some songs to my lead pastor. And he's like, you know what? I originally thought that it would take you a while to <laughs> get good, but these are good. And hmm. he wanted to record them. And so that's where um, I got connected to our mutual friend, Chris Clayton. And, yeah. and so brought those songs to Chris and then Chris liked them. Now, granted, I didn't have like a portfolio of songs to choose the best out of. They were all I had were three at yeah, the time. Yeah. And he's like, these are good. Um, let's, let's get you in this uh, ministry called Kingdom Songs to hmm. develop this writer in you. And um, it was out of that program that built some more relationships that paved the way for a second EP that would later, uh, later come. And so the journey of songwriting has been a unique one because it's not one that I saw myself doing, but realizing that I get approached more and more by people from our own congregation going, 
when are you going to give us a new song that's that's ours you know and wow. so that's been a really neat experience to go like they really hunger and crave a unique voice in to be added to the collective voices that's going on in worship and so it's pretty special yeah so i'm gonna want to nerd out in that for a minute uh with the mechanics of that so when you're going to write for your congregation are you just kind of sitting down and asking god like hey what does the church need to say or do these songs kind of come out of like worship sets where maybe a spontaneous moment will turn into a more you know arrangement or and also too like how much of your team because there's a lot of people that are listening that you know they are a worship pastor their church as well and maybe they're wanting to write songs maybe they already do whatever that looks like for them but like what has been your kind of process to like from that be that my vision to like the second ep of like how did you kind of tap into the heartbeat of your church and then, you know, go through the whole process of getting songs out. Cause I've, I know that you guys have done a great job and I've got to be a part of watching you lead a song that you wrote, you know, every, uh, every crown mm-hmm. with your church and seeing the power in that. So like, like, is that journey different for every song or, or what are the, like the mechanics of that as far as including team and then bringing that out into your congregation, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It's not, there's not a formula. And I think you, uh, and everybody else that have written songs will attest to that. Sometimes they they come naturally. Uh, they come from your own brain. You write them out all on your own, or other times it's co-writes. For me, um, most of the songs that when I'm sitting down to write in a session with friends, I always prefer to write with other people. Um, it's yeah. been a while since I've actually tried to write a song by myself. Probably would be a good exercise <laughs> to, to do that. But when I sit down to write a song with friends a lot of times the 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 inspiration comes honestly from stories um so many of the writers that i listen to they have they're constantly impressing on my mind this idea of every conversation every interaction with your wife with your kids with your Hmm. friends um complete strangers are fertile soil for songs and so listening to what people are saying and and so a great example is the song come what may on our uh that's the title track of our second ep came out of this idea of a lot of struggle and hardship that various stories in our church were experiencing and i wanted to give them something to sing in the midst of it when when it doesn't feel okay and so in our in my com, uh, conversations with some of the co-writers, the the line that just sung to us, that spoke out to us, was "For you are king above this; you're seated mm-hmm. on your throne." And with the the emphasis on this, whatever this is, mm-hmm. uh, it was it was not specified in the song. It's like whatever I'm facing, you're king above this. And whenever we sing that, it's like you could just hear the church just get louder. As a leader, you get the the privilege of having them sing towards you and <laughs> to hear their volume and energy. And every time I get to that part of the song, it's like there is this declaration of, yes, God, you are on your throne. And then we get to the the bridge and we get to sing scripture. Your ways are higher. Your plans are never shaken. You have the final say. You're working for our good. You always have your way. Like, mm. my gosh, like with yeah. such a privilege to take the story and give them a scripture lens to view their life. I mean, what a privilege. And um, I mean, it's a great honor to, to do that. Man, that's awesome. Also too, I wanted to, you know, talk about going into the kingdom songs environment and just like learning in general, like how much of your journey, you know, as a writer, like, you know, Chris Clayton saying for you to do that. And then your, you know, church leadership, partnering with you, you know, in that pursuit, like how much has that shaped your journey as being a part of those types of events? Tremendously, honestly, the, the shaping of like what I just can't, um, wrap my head around and just honestly, it's just, is being, is paying attention, being aware, like God stirred my heart initially to just start thinking in this direction with my lead pastor, who then led me to a relationship with Chris Clayton, who then out of that met, built more relationships through the kingdom songs environment, other co-writers and brothers. And even you and I, we didn't even come together until many years after I'd been a part of kingdom songs in the first place. So 
there were writers before you. And then I meet you a complete stranger at the time. And we're just, we're getting together to write songs. We don't even know our stories to write songs, but those, those trickled up as we, you know, worked together for a week. And then out of that moment, out of kingdom songs, um, paying attention to more opportunities. There was a, a friend of mine, uh, actually not even a friend. It was a complete stranger. I was just part of a massive Facebook group. And he reached out just cold calling me about worship circle. Mm. And it was out of that mentoring program that Todd Fields put on that introduced me to some more guys just in ministry. Again, I'm not thinking through the songwriting lens. I'm just thinking, yeah, yeah this sounds like this could be a cool thing for me to grow in. And from that, that built, that brought more songwriting relationships as we find common denominators. And this is the thing that is blowing my mind, Brian, in the in the songwriting process and just being, I don't even know if it's a matter of obedience, but just, just uh, seeing every relationship, every contact as a potential uh, for a path. And hmm. so like when, with all these relationships that come out of worship circle, those one of those relationships ended up me befriending a, one of the guys that works at North Point. We write a song together, and now all of a sudden, that song is a song on North Point worship. And I'm a oh. I'm a nobody, like no one knows who I am, and mm. I never I could not have orchestrated that. But we built a friendship over a brotherhood and worship ministry and family. We find out we both have a common interest in songwriting. We try our hand in it, and it's a good song, and they want to record that. And the same thing applies even today where I'm just stewarding these relationships and building in friendships. And I got a text the other day that um, there's a, a one of our rights that we're going to be doing is uh, being eyed from integrity because um, New Life Church in Colorado Springs is potentially looking for um, some more songs for their record. Just to be able to be writing, thinking that this song might get picked up from a larger audience just because of the relationships in the room blow me away. And I, I never saw that coming. I just was going, I like this person. I want to know this person. Let's talk. Let's build a friendship and write together. And that has turned into something that is growing to be a larger sphere of influence. And that's, that to me has been the biggest thing about songwriting is like, I'm truly writing for our our church and what they need to Mm -hmm. say and sing and put on their lips. And if God really wants to, take that and make give it more influence he will like i feel like i'm a walking testimony of that like i'm gonna be faithful to our people but if he wants another song to go beyond that he will provide the right relationships and people to expand that and i mean i'm still just stunned at the the level of um the way god has brought songwriting into my life and how that has been used to impact people beyond the walls of our church Thanks for sharing that. That's like so good and so encouraging to anybody because it's true. Like when you write songs by yourself, because that's how we all start usually, you know, because that's, it's easiest, you know, it's like, I can just write right now. And so then as you continue to work with more people and you step out in faith into those relationships, like I didn't know anybody. Right. In 2017, before I went to Nashville to a, a writing event with Full Circle Music, like yep. I, I just wrote because I thought that's what I had to do. Yep. Like, and now I feel like I know hundreds of people and have written probably with maybe hundreds of people or you know a lot more people than I ever would have known. And just like what you said, you never know what that song from that random day will turn into. You don't write for that because you can't control it and have no idea what it's going to be. But I, when I talked to Susie about this, like there's, there's, there's a day where you've got to dig the hole and plant the seed, mm-hmm. cover it up and then move on. Yep. You know? And so by doing that, digging those ditches and planting those seeds, one day the hope is, is in a kingdom sense is you turn around and there's a forest mm. of all the things because, but you had to put the work in on that day. It doesn't just come by just turning around. There's a forest. You had to sweat. You yep. had to, you know, bleed sometimes it hurts. You know, it, it could be tough, but it's always worth it because God is watching every single thing you do, whether in front of people or not. So by putting in that effort and two, I wanted to say like, like, Yes, you write with your church in mind, for sure. 
but they also, your church gets to benefit greatly by you expanding into these new circles where you may write a song mm-hmm. that could end up on a new life, or you, you have a song that they're singing at North Point now, you know, mm-hmm. like for one, you're able to carry that if you want to at your church also, but by you expanding your sphere and ex- your skill set, your church is directly benefiting from that, whether it's the literal song or not, right. just your experience, because you can bring all of that to your people. So that's incredible, man. And I, uh, I'm excited for you because it's been fun to to watch, you know, your journey. And, and I love all the songs we write, we've written together along absolutely. the way and I'm excited for all the ones we'll have yet to write. So absolutely, uh, man, it's been so good. I just, I always like to ask people, what's a piece of advice that you'd give to the younger Aaron, you know, something that maybe it could be for better, for worse, whatever it might look like. But if you could talk to your younger self along this journey, what would you say, you know, to encourage yourself along the way and also anyone listening? Mm. So much, right? <laughs> so much. It's a loaded question because I feel still feel like the younger Aaron, if I'm honest. Mm. I feel like there is still so much that I'm trying to learn. And, you know, for me, I'm I'm a I'm prone to be a worrier. And earlier in a previous conversation, we you and I were talking, and you know, I think for me that if I could tell myself like anything, it would be staying close to the source, staying close mm. to God. Having grown up in a, a scripture uh, centric home, it it was knowing God and hearing about God was very common. But for me, I I really struggled with the discipline of staying uh, close to the Lord at a personal discipline level, um, because mm-hmm. I think that so much of that would have directed my thoughts in my heart when life got hard or when ministry got hard, friendships got hard. Because I am so prone to worry. And um, if I could speak to my younger self, I would say that the faith that I long for, I can have when I stay when I stay close to Him, when I abide with God and take that with Him. And so much of that is just honestly time in the Word and prayer. And that sounds all like, yeah, that's that's real basic. And give me something more, Aaron. But the truth is, like, if I'm wanting something to really change in my life, there has to be. A pursuit of the Lord. For me, what I, I want so badly uh, for my own life is to just have my life be, it be said of me that I was a man who walked closely with God so that mm. when they come near, when they draw near to me and they're talking, they're sensing a presence of the Lord on me. Um, just like when Moses came down from Sinai and his face shone and they were so overwhelmed by um, the presence of God in Moses, that that would be the same of me. And the only way that that happens is when I abide. And so I would say, Aaron, younger Aaron, ab- abide, like stay close. Don't get lost in the doing of for God. Focus on the being with God. That will inform your songwriting. That will inform your relationships. That will inform your life choices that you make, the freedoms that you have. And it would also certainly mean a lot less worry because <laughs> mm. when I can fall in the faithfulness of God, I know he's got me. And, and it's it's one of those lessons that I feel like I'm still learning. You know, it's, it's the most important thing we can do. It's literally why God made man because he wanted to have a relationship with us. Like that's the purpose. So although it might seem basic, like because it's not fancy mm-hmm. or it's not, super heady it's literally the foundation on which everything else happens yeah and it's the hardest because our minds are always racing because like you said i'm I'm the same way worrier you know like oh man i woke up what do i got to do today oh man uh what's gonna go wrong oh man like none of that has anything to do with hanging out with god that's right. hanging out with me my own thoughts worries and fears right 100%. so I, so like making that intentional thought breathing it in like, hey, I don't have to worry about tomorrow. It has enough worries of its own. Okay, I can read that, but I need to believe it and actually live it out. Right. So I'm so glad you said that because like that, that's like the first thing. And like, because everything else builds upon that, man. So yeah. And without that time with God, what do we have to say? You know, really, if we're trying to write for the church or trying to just try to be a good follower of Jesus. What do we have to offer if we're not hanging out with them? (laughs) Absolutely. I mean, everything that would be written would be just cliches and, Mm -hmm. and chaff. And I want, 
I can't sit down and write a song. I can't sit down and exhort from the stage as a, in a worship pastor moment and say anything that moves or changes lives unless the spirit of God is breathing. He mm. alone breathes life. I mean, from we see that from Adam. We say that all through scripture that his breath is life. And so if I'm going to speak and say something in a song or say something in the microphone, it has to be through the power of the spirit. And that only comes when I am, am close. And I felt that in my life where I step, I move away or I, I phone it in on a Sunday and yeah. there's, and, and he's merciful, right? Like he could still do something. Even if I phone it in, he's yep. his ability to move is not contingent upon me acting or not acting, but mm. to be used uh, to be a vessel of grace in those moments is, I mean, you want to talk about feeling life in your bones is when you feel yourself a vessel and you're feeling used by God to bring life and to breathe life to other people. Um, whether that's in a worship context, whether that is in conversations that you have in your workplace, um, whether it's in songwriting, anything. I mean, those moments um, are what I feel like I live for. And I'm mm. realizing how much I've undervalued them because I feel like that's just can happen all the time. Well, you know, it's staying close with Jesus. It's walking with him. And I mean, I, I attribute a lot of this, honestly, to my wife, who has just simply invited me into reading um, the like a one-year Bible plan with her, has kept mm -hmm. me more in the word than I think I've been in years. And wow. it's because of that, that, that simple act of just it being accountable to my wife for reading, you know, and just so that we could have something to talk about and not go, oh, I'm weeks behind, you know, and you're way ahead of me. So, I'm going to quit, but it's staying in the word. And yes, you know, sometimes gritting your teeth when you go through Leviticus and when everybody wants to quit, you know, like, but yeah, there's, there's, the one. <laughs> there's such grace, there's such mercy um, in every ounce of scripture. And I'm not trying to sound preachy at all as much as just go like God's word is life and it informs, it, it literally holds everything together in, in mm. our life by his words, Jesus' words, everything holds together, as it says in Colossians. And so to be filled with Scripture daily helped and just informs my life um, much more clearly than I feel like it has in, in a while. And I'm just incredibly grateful for that. Man, and, and I know that this is not some profound thought, but when you're saying that, it just it reminded me like the Bible, God's Word is literally the roadmap for life. And yes. without it, we get lost. And I, and I feel like even more, even more than just the roadmap, um, it's just revealing who Jesus is, who God is. And it's mm. like, I find when I can find myself in his story, um, that's what matters. It's not so much telling me, should I take this job or should I not take this job? Because we know that that's not what the Bible is for, but it reveals mm -hmm. God's heart and where, what he wants to do in my life. He wants my holiness. He wants mm. me to be transformed in the image of Jesus. And, and if he does that through, he does that through relationships like you and I have had, um, through the relationships that come and go in our families, in our friends. Um, and it, I mean, it is truly an amazing thing when I start seeing my life, not so much me centric, but it's all about Jesus. And mm -hmm. when I can humble myself to put myself at his feet in that way, man, that's where our final life really begins. Man, that's that's a mic drop moment right there. And <laughs> preach preach all day, man, because that's that's the kind of thing that that we all need to hear, be reminded of. Because it, it is like I I forget the quote where it's from, but you know, it's simple. That doesn't mean it's easy, right? You know, so like taking that time to go through the Bible in a year, like because we all get it's a new year. I'm gonna read you know the the Gospels every day for 365 days, and then like. Nine days later, it's like, oh, I'll do it later. Uh, so it's like taking the the chunks because, yeah, it may take less time per day. But when you actually keep that 10, 15, 20 minutes up every day for that whole period, like it greatly outweighs those little bursts. Mm -hmm. So like and that's the consistency. That's the walk. Mm -hmm. You know, it's we always say, you know, walk the race, you know, because you'll get there. You got to keep a good pace, you know, because like we're not called to like just sit around, you know, right. like God needs us to do things. But ultimately, we get the fuel and the direction from those moments of hanging out. And there's a lot of yeah. grace there. Like give yourself grace. Like if 
even in a study, uh, if you're doing a year plan or whatever, like there's grace, like this doesn't have to be a legalism thing where you you're kicking yourself. If you miss a day or two or even a week. It's just, mm-hmm. it's doing it. It's just getting back on. It's a relationship. And, and I've, ever since I was a kid and I grew up hearing, you know, that God wants a relationship with me. I know that intellectually, but I really forget that in practice that mm. I need to be bringing my relationship to the Lord. And so much of that is through study of his word, through prayer, through talking to him. And so there's grace. Like, I don't want, I don't want my son coming to me feeling guilty that he hadn't talked to me. I just want him to talk yeah. to me, you yeah. know? And, and so at the same time, it's like, there's just so much grace. If you've fallen off the horse and it's been a while, it's okay. Get back on it. You know, go, you know, open up this word, spend 10 or 15 minutes a day. Like that's, I think the Lord just wants our heart and not our obligation. Man, I've, I've felt that before. I'm like, oh man, it's nine 30. I haven't done the Devo yet today. And I'm like, wait a minute. Like God's not mad at me. Right. Even the fact that we're like, I'm not saying in a guilty way, but like we're considering, we're putting enough stock in that into our lives to know that we might be outside of whatever our little routine is in the morning. Like that means that we're actually putting enough into it to where it actually matters. And I think that is what's so valuable is like, if we want to experience life to its fullest, then like God has to matter above all, Mm. you know, and that might be in the day you skip, you know, but it also happens when you get to hang out with your son and see him hit a home run or when you are, you know, hanging out with your dad, whatever, whatever it looks like, like that's what, that's the one thing that, you know, mentioned worship circle. Like the thing that I learned the most from worship circle was sure. The practical stuff is amazing, but it was the thing that like worship is a posture of the heart and anything you do is an opportunity to have to, to like worship the Lord, but you only are in that state of mind when you're spending the time, you know, developing the relationship because relationships are two ways, right? I mean, we know if we only talk to our spouses once a week, then we're in trouble. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. So like, and our kids or whoever, you know, so like, I love that, man. So man, this has been so encouraging to me personally. So, you know, I'm, I'm just so glad to get to hang out with you today and uh just hear your story and stuff so what's what's the uh, the best way for people to connect with you you know and connect with healing street and the music you're putting out like just i'll put all the links and stuff in the description but just let everybody know like how they can connect with you sure yeah um, i'm not the best social media guy but i have it and i use yeah. it uh as i can and so you can find me on facebook by looking me up or on instagram aaron underscore hoskins is kind of the primary ways to get in touch. But if you also wanted okay. to shoot me an email, I have my email on our website. You can go to Hulen Street, H U L E N Street spelled out dot com. That's our website. And there's a staff page there. You can find me there. That's uh, probably the best way to, to get in touch. Awesome, man. Well, thanks for sharing that. And before we go, I always like to pray over everybody. Uh, so I'm going to pray for you, man. Mm. Uh, God, thank you so much for Aaron. Thank you so much for Janie and his whole family and uh, just all that he's doing to be so obedient. Ever since that moment, singing that song at the fourth service where you sort of cemented this direction and purpose in his life, he's been faithfully falling after you in this way, God. And just to see the fruit of that, you know, from from my point of view, has been so incredible and inspiring to, to see that you are a faithful God. You're faithful to your word. Even if we don't understand at the moment what it even means that you say, God, as long as we just give you what we can, which is all that we have to offer, Lord, you will just always exceed yes, any hope, any dream, any expectation we have, God. As we continue to lay our lives at your feet, Lord, you're just so so good to us, God. And, and we can see that through the testimony that that Aaron's brought here today, God. And, and as he's continuing to go and finding new opportunities and, and you're continuing to raise his level and his reach and his influence and his skill set, God, as he blesses his church with the music that you inspire in him and also now churches abroad, God, we just continue to, to see that uh, inspiration and creativity just rise up in him, God, so that everything he puts his hand to the plow, God, it's just with your power and your might, God. And, and then uh, that's where that's where you can really show up and do things to, to use him as a vessel that you already have done, God. So we just, we're thankful for him. We're thankful for this time we got to spend here today, God. We just praise you for the things that yet to be done. And uh, we give it all in your name. Your name we pray. Amen. Amen. 
We want to help reach as many Christian indie artists and songwriters as possible. And one way we can do that is with your help. So if you could take a minute and leave us a review on iTunes, that would be so appreciated. This is how the iTunes algorithm will push this content out to more and more Christian indie artists and songwriters. So like I said, if you could just take a couple seconds, leave us a review, that would be so awesome. It means so much to us and we would really appreciate it.